Hi, it's Neil Sean here on your entertainment news. Now, if I said to you, the comedians and Shep's Banjo Boys, you are in for a treat, as my guest today is the very talented and the very lovely Mr. John Orchard. Remember though, John? If you miss it, you'll miss out. Don't miss John today on your entertainment news. John, thank you so much for coming in today. Now, first, before we go any further, I want to know what's happening at the Museum of Comedy that we should all go and see. What's the big news? The big news is that on the 29th of October, we've got a 2 p.m. show at the Museum of Comedy Theatre in Bloomsbury, London, in London's glittering West End. <laughs> the West End, but you're used to that. But yes, what, what's it about? What, well, what it's celebrating uh, the 50th anniversary of a band that I play with and used to play with and still play with, 50 years in show business, which obviously is a Fantastic landmark. Yeah. And the name of the band? The band is Shep's Banjo Boys. Which, of course, found fame. I, you know, when you say 50 years, can you believe it's 50? Do you know what I mean? I look and think, because I've loved your shows and I, I watched everything, you know, the lovely Johnny Hamp put together. And um, I remember you, I think I saw, would I have seen you at the North Pier? Yes, in Blackpool indeed. as a kid, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the band was at the North Pier yeah, in Blackpool, yeah. 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 What was that like? Talk to me about that. Because you, you're now big, you're on telly, yeah. and this is in a time when you're on telly and, you know, people are watching their millions. Were you nervous about that, first of all, when you, you realised how many people were watching? Well, the first time we did a show for Johnny Hamp on the North Pier, it was a show called Road Show, which was actually at six o'clock in, uh, in the evening. Oh, really? This was before we got the comedians with Johnny Hamp. And he put us there, and at the end of the pier, you kind of assume that everybody's going to be organised. We got yeah. to the end of the pier, they put us on a bandstand. Now, if you're the trombone player, you've got your trombone. If you're oh, the yeah. sousaphone player, you've got your sousaphone. If you're a banjo player, you've got your banjo. Yeah. If you are a drummer, then you take your drum kit with you. But if yeah. you're a piano player, you kind of expect there's going to be a piano <laughs> there. We got to the end of the North Pier, no, no piano. piano. <laughs> Luckily, the record we were promoting was our first single called Half Time Whistle. So I pulled a penny whistle out of my pocket and I mimed to a penny whistle, whereas normally I'm the piano player. Player. So that oh, was yeah. that's my recollection of the North Pier in Blackpool. And nobody noticed that you didn't have a piano. Seemingly not. <laughs> seemingly not. Don't you love that though? That's wonderful. That showbiz, isn't it? You know, because you think, oh gosh, you know, nobody's brought the, and you think, oh, what we're we going to do? I know. Yeah. And you, you pull something out of the hat. In this yeah. case, a penny was sort from the inside pocket. Yeah. <laughs> and then you went into the the famous. Pier Theatre, I presume, and then... We were at the Palladium at the time. Oh, so you did the Palladium. Yeah, the... sorry. So what's that like then? You know, you've come from where you've started and now you're at the world-famous London Palladium. What was your first thoughts when they told you that's where you were going? Well, as a child, playing the piano back in 1954, when I first started having piano lessons at the age of nine, quite soon after I started, a standard line that my parents and my family and my friends would say, oh, one day we're going to see you at the London Palladium, one day we're going to see you on the telly. And of course, as a kid, it goes over your head. You can't, you kind of think to yourself, really? the telly, the Palladium. <laughs> this is at a time when I'm watching Liberace on the television oh, on a yeah. Sunday afternoon and thinking, well, he's the kind of guy that would be on the telly. I'd never be on the yeah. telly. He's the kind of guy that would top the bill at the London Palladium, but I would never do that. Because he's huge at this point, though, isn't oh, he? Oh, marvellous, Massive. absolutely. And if I think about my influences as a piano player, in the 1950s, it was Russ Conway and Liberace. Oh, yeah. So yeah. people used to say to me, you'll be at the Palladium one day, you'll be on the telly. Yeah. So when I actually did find out that the band were going to be playing at the London Palladium, of course, I just thought it's just like a dream come true. Wow. Marvellous. And the fascinating thing was we'd never done a theatre stage tour before in the UK. And when it came into London, we were doing 13 shows a week. And That's a big commitment, though, isn't it? Well, it is. I mean, you yeah. were doing 6.15 and 8.45, so twice nightly. Yeah. And then on a Saturday, 2 o'clock, 5 o'clock and 8 o'clock. Gosh. And the thing was, on a Saturday, you got to the point where you thought, I don't know where I am. You didn't know, <laughs> you didn't know which show you were in the middle of because yeah. you're doing the show, like, on a rotation. Yeah. Yeah, so, I don't think people appreciate that, do they, actually, John? I, I know exactly what you mean. When you're in a show like that and, and you come, you think to yourself, what, what is this Wednesday matinee? Is this Thursday? I'm not quite sure where we're doing. You lose sense so, of time. And you're in the theatre early. People think you, like, rock up at 6.15 and just get on your piano. No. But you have to be there a couple of hours before, a bit of sound check every day. That's right. Meet everybody else, get together, and then the producer's got to get you on there and That's get right. you going. Yeah. I mean, when you walk down that famous door, though, 
and go through the stage door that yes, would have played. Yes. That must have been, you know, you must have thought, if they could see me now, that type of thing. I know, you know? it was just, I mean, I was 22 at the time, yeah. so, you know. A boy, really. I yeah. suppose so. All, we, we, all, all seven members of Shep's Banjo Boys yeah. we were all in our 20s at that stage. But yes, just to, I mean, we knew that it was the world's greatest variety theatre. As children, in our, in our teenage years, we'd seen Sunday Night at the London Palladium, so we knew the theatre so well. Yeah. Everybody knows the Palladium. Yeah. And then to actually be on that stage, we with 2,300 people 13 times a week. I, I did the maths the other day. We did, we did six months there. <laughs> yeah. Which and is we, unheard of now, isn't it? For, for that type of show, do you know what I mean? I mean, it's essentially just a great variety show with yeah. you and all these these guys who can make people laugh. Yeah. I mean, you could, I don't think you could find those sort of comedians today. No, no. Well, actually, they would play a big arena on their own. They wouldn't want to be in yeah. the show with six other comedians, yeah, I suppose. Actually, that's a good idea. Yeah, never thought of that. You wouldn't, would you? You wouldn't get them down, no. no. But anyway, I just put it into the calculator and I thought 2,300 seats times 13 shows a week times six months. We played to over three quarters of a million million people in that summer season in 1972. Wow. So that but, is a lot of people. Yeah. A lot of people. It was, a, it was a show that sold very well. So going right back though, yeah. you, you talk about um, you're a young boy in the 50s, you're learning piano. Did, were your family musical or how did all, you know, did you just find it yourself? Well, it used to be the case that I used to go to, because I lived in Harrow, actually, in northwest oh, London. Oh, gosh, yeah. Well, it, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we must have lived in the rough part, I think. <laughs> and I used to go to my grandmother's house. She lived in Kingsbury, which is near Harrow, and she had a piano. And every time I went to the house, I'd get on the piano and tinkle away there. Mm -hmm. And in the end, she said, could you take that piano to your house, please? <laughs> Not I, exactly inspiring, is it? No, <laughs> but I had lessons and then took exams, and then all of a sudden I was playing for amateur talent shows and winning those, which was lovely, and then amateur dramatic societies, writing pantomimes as a teenager. Wow. But never knowing, of course, that I was going to actually, in the end, within probably in. five years, get into show business. Did you, but when you were doing that, was that your, did you think though, John, that you could make a living out of this? So was there another plan B that you thought, I'd like to do this, but I might end up working in a bank or is it, do you know what I mean? Yeah, That's well, I did end up being just an accounts clerk because I, <laughs> you know, you can't see at that stage a yeah. way to get into show business. And yeah. I always think that these things are just a series of good luck moments, you know, and, and, and I just had a couple of coincidental moments that happened that got me into show business. And what were they? What was the, the moment that you well, thought, oh, I... this is a good point? <laughs> What had happened was I'd become a computer programmer, which in the 1960s was wow. quite a thing. Yeah. This is when computers were the size of a fridge instead of something yeah. you could put in your inside pocket. Yeah. And uh, I went to Manchester. I found myself in Manchester working for a pharmaceutical company as a computer programmer. And no sooner in Manchester, and I opened up the Manchester Evening News, as we always did, those of us that were musicians at heart, we always bought the Manchester Evening News on a Thursday evening because on a Thursday you had the adverts under bands, musicians and oh, artists yeah. offering yeah. work. And in there it said, Pianists Wanted for Shep's Banjo Boys. And I'd been to the venue, which is called the Golden Garter yeah. in Manchester, where I'd been to see the band actually not so long ago. And this was only four months after the venue had opened. Oh, wow. And I thought, actually, I could do that because they play the old ragtime sing-along stuff. And yeah, that's the yeah. kind of stuff that I do probably better than anything else. So yeah. I went for the audition, sneaked away in my lunch hour from the day job, had the audition. You did though in those days, did you? Because first of all, you don't really want to tell people in case it's a failure. Oh. You know, there's that side of it. But then the other side of it, you're thinking, if they think I'm going to leave my job, they might fire you. So you've got that level as well that you think, well, I'll play along with that. Yeah. So you came back from your, your lunch break. Did you think you'd done well or, you know, how did it end the audition? He told me I got the job there and wow. then. I was auditioned by, oh, by Will Shepherd, who was the, uh, the father of the two other boys that were playing yeah. banjo in the band. And Will just said to me, can you play Alexander's Ragtime Band? I said, what key do you want it in? He played his banjo, I played the piano, and I got the job. Wow. He said to me, are you a member of Equity? I didn't even know what Equity <laughs> was then. I said, no. He said, uh, you'll have a membership card by Monday. He pulled a few, this was in the days when you couldn't get into equity yeah. unless you'd done 40 weeks in the provinces. Oh, yeah, yeah. So I'm probably telling a story out of school here, but... No, but that's interesting to know because, as you say, um, in those days, there was, that was a very powerful, you know, tool and agency. Oh, yeah. Nowadays, you don't need it. Mm. But, you know, when you think about it, to, you, that could have made or break you, make or break you if mm. you said no or, or, you know, I'm not bothered. Could have lost whatever. me the job. Yeah, Luckily, yeah. he knew somebody, obviously, at the Manchester branch of equity, and yeah. I had my equity card by the following Monday. So when you told them at the Accounts office, 
you were going, <laughs> you were going to join the Chips Banjo Boys at the Golden Garter. Yeah. How did that go now? Well, I mean, they were all quite fascinated because people actually like talking to people that are in show business. Yeah. They like to hear all the backstage stories. Yeah. And luckily, yeah. because this was only a half an hour slot from 10.15 to 10.45, six nights a week, I could carry on with the day job wow. and do the playing in the evening. So I was living this double life. Nine to five, I was a computer programmer. Yeah. Ten o'clock at night, I was a pianist with a band, supporting unbelievable big-name stars. But isn't that interesting? You say you say about that. That's the, the folly of youth. You've got a lot of energy at that point. Oh, in, you yeah. know what I mean? Take if somebody said that to you now, you go, "What time? Well, I'm normally in bed by." I, well, you know? I'd have to be <laughs> yeah. these days. You wouldn't want to get up the morning after and think, "Oh, I'll just go and do a full day's work and then go off." So you get this job. Well, who was the first person that you played with? Who was the first name and that you thought, "Oh gosh, I've, I've arrived." Well, Lonnie. Donigan was actually oh, yeah. topping the bill the week that I started, Lonnie Donigan. Yeah. And I mean, he had the most fantastic act. He had been doing summer seasons and pantomimes, so he wasn't just there to plug the old records like My Old Man's a Dustman yeah. and Rock Island Line. He had a fully formed theatre show, which was fabulous. Oh, yeah, because he was so well loved. Oh, absolutely. People loved yeah. Lonnie Donigan. This was 1969, so it yeah. was a few years after he'd had the hit records. Yeah. But uh, fabulous to see him on stage, yeah. and that was my first experience. And then week after week, every week a different name. Wow. But when you say like, because I always think it's the first one. I, you know, one of my first big interviews was um, Norman Wisdom. Yes. As, you know, for TV. And I was so nervous. You know, even when he came in, you know, people like, you, oh, your tummy's going over. And, oh, you know, what will it be like? Uh, so when you saw him up close, was Lonnie everything you thought a star should be? Because I always think that, don't you? You think... <laughs> Are they really? You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah, I know. Well, we were lucky because our dressing room at the Golden Garter was on way on the way from the star. The star dressing room meant that the top of the bell act had to walk past our dressing room to get oh. to the stage, and luckily the two banjo players, the, sorry, the three banjo players, the Shepherd Boys and their dad Will, they ran a photographic business. They had a very successful photography business, oh. and they had the rights at the Golden Garter the sole rights to shoot customers' pictures. So, of course, we had professional fo photographers on the premises. Oh. This meant that whenever the star of the week would walk past our dressing room, either way, on the way to the stage to do their act or on the way back after doing their hour, hour on stage, yeah. we would try and grab them and say, can we have a photo? Wow. So we've got this wonderful archive of these lovely black and white photographs professionally taken, yeah. which, of course, are wonderful to look back on. I mean, you, you say that, and that is, as you say, absolutely beautiful because it's moments in time, mm. you know? I mean, I, you, you've sent some lovely pictures to us, and we, we recently just lost the wonderful Bruce, of course. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, it's hard to imagine because people know you in career sections and the audience probably watching, a lot of people know that it was a massive variety star, but a lot of people know him as the host of Strictly. But yes. when he came to your club, he's now, he's going back into his one-man show, isn't he? His Absolutely. one-man act. Absolutely. What was he like then? How did he go down, you know, with, with the audience? Just tore the place apart. And wow. it's interesting to note that on the opening night, the 7th of October, 1968, Trust House Forte, who owned the Golden Garter, and also the Talk of the Town in London, because it was Manchester's sister club to yeah. the Talk of the Town. They chose Bruce Forsyth as the opening act on that particular week, and the whole mm. thing was sold out. He just tore the place apart. Fantastic. What did he... What, can you remember what he did? Because I know he, he played virtually everything but the kitchen zing, didn't yeah. he? Could do it. I thought Bruce was just... He could do anything. Yeah. You know? Well, of course, he was a sensational piano player. Absolutely yeah. brilliant. He... As soon as he could, he got off that stage and got down onto the dance floor and started working the tables at the, in the front row. Because yeah. being a nightclub, you're very close to the audience. You haven't got this chasm, yeah. which is the orchestra pit between you and the audience. And he was down there with his microphone, talking to the people in the audience, and he was doing his patter, you know? Yeah, so he yeah. was doing his jokes, and then, of course, he'd go into a tap dance. <laughs> fabulous dancer. Yeah, he was a brilliant dancer. So he'd sing, he'd play the piano, he'd tap yeah. dance. I mean, he was just a, a first-rate entertainer, and as you say, very sadly, lost him very recently. The Golden Garter, I didn't realise this until looking at it, but it was the sister to the Talk of the Town. Yeah. Why did they pick, um, you know, the area that it was in? Was it Withenshaw? This was... Why <laughs> did they, you know, I, I don't mean that because, you know, I've been to Manchester, but it, it's an interesting thing, is it? Because we had all these clubs, you know, turning up. Like, um, we had Battle Variety. Yeah. Uh, wait for your theatre club. Indeed. And then there were quite a few, weren't they? You know, they're not as big, but like in Leeds and you know places like that. Mm. And they're all vying for top name yes. acts to come along. Absolutely. So you uh, lucky because I presume they could do a deal with Talk of the Town 
and then they'd have to do a week or something in Manchester. Presume, very often, flip the, over. Very often, yeah. The yeah. star that just did maybe they would perhaps do a month at the talk of the town, yeah. but then they come and do a week or two for us at yeah. the, the Golden Garter in Manchester. But I just think it was a lucky situation because they actually had. I mean, I love the the difference between what happened in London. Yeah. Picture the scene. You've got the Hippodrome Theatre, the Frank Matcham. Yeah. Architect. Beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful Hippodrome Theatre that was built in 1900 in Leicester Square, yeah. and they decide in 1958 that they're going to turn this into the talk of the town. Yeah. Fast forward nine years to 1968, 1967, 68 in Manchester and they haven't got a listed building that they can do something with in the city centre. They find a 10-pin bowling alley <laughs> that's in the flight path of Manchester Airport <laughs> in the middle of a council estate yeah. but it's got the potential. Yeah. I mean architecturally from the outside it's got nothing to commend it but once yeah. you got inside this was a place that they put on seven separate levels to give everybody oh. a fantastic view. It had twice the capacity of the talk of the town. It could seat 1,400 people. They went in there, they got their drinks, they got a meal, they could dance, they could see the support act, and they could see this big name at 11 o'clock in the evening. Yeah. And you were in the middle of it all. We were there. We used yeah. to go on half an hour before the top of the bell act. Our job was to warm the audience up. Yeah. I mean, the band got the gig, first of all, thinking they were only going to be there for a week. Yeah. But in the end, stay for nearly four years. The band did nearly... No, more than 1,000 shows. Wow. So we saw everybody come and go. It was fabulous. Yeah. And, and after, you you know, um, your first big star, uh, Lonnie Donegan, yeah. who, who were the ones that really made, you know, resonated with you that you thought, oh, yeah, they are, you, you, you know, I always think, you know, John, there's a point where you think, I know why you're a star. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yes. There are certain people who you yes. think, yes. yeah, I can see why you are big. Yeah. Um, who were the ones for you that you remember and you thought, oh, yeah, these were good? It's the confidence when they went on stage. Yeah. One is a classic example. It has to be Tommy Cooper. Oh, lovely. Yeah. But people don't know that before the curtain opened, he meticulously would be setting up these huge trestle tables. He probably had three trestle tables across the stage, absolutely cluttered with all of his tricks and gags. And he would go through and make sure everything was in the right place. Of course, when the act began, it was all designed to make it look like he didn't know Shambles. what was happening. Next. That's right. And I love the fact that, you know, he could just actually, he was introduced via voiceover. Yeah. And he could then just laugh into the microphone. And then he could get the audience in fits of giggles. Just from his one And it would be maybe two minutes before he actually would be seen. Just oh. gets the whole place erupting just from him doing a ha-ha-ha yeah. into yeah. the mic. And then, yeah, and then, as you say, you kind of think, how do, if other people did that, it wouldn't work. Mm. So that is a sheer talent to be able to command that audience. It is. Behind a curtain with just a microphone. Having said that, it's only in latter years that I've read about it and I found out that actually to get Tommy into the Golden Garter at the right time, they would have to find what pub he was in locally <laughs> and actually bring him physically to the venue. <laughs> and I think he would have had quite a lot of Dutch courage before he got <laughs> on stage. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. No, why not? Nothing wrong with that. So, uh, so uh, Tommy Cooper was a name for you. You've got some lovely pictures of it. Frankie Howard uh, was another big name. He was. Um, but when you think about it at that time, he was, um, oh, don't worry about this, but he was, um, uh, what's the word? I mean, doing a nightclub must have been quite daunting for him because he'd done theatres and radio. And, yes. and I, I interviewed him and he was a very nervous yes. character, you know, I found a bit um, bumbly and, yes. and, you know, um, a, a bit morose off camera, I felt. You yes, know, well, they down. say this about a lot of comedians, don't they? Mm. That off stage, they're very uncertain of themselves. Yeah. They're self-doubting, racked with self-doubt yeah. all the time. I remember Frankie Howard, famously came past our uh, dressing room. He walked actually straight into our dressing room. Seven young boys, all in their 20s, all just in the process of getting changed. Yeah. In walks Frankie Oh, Howard. gosh, worried. <laughs> <laughs> Frankie walks in with a pair of cufflinks in his hand. He said, could one of you put your, my, the cufflinks in for me? I couldn't get there quick enough. This is the guy that I idolised as a comedian, yeah. as a teenager, and now all of a sudden he wants me to put his cufflinks in. Wow. I'll do that. Oh, I was gosh. there like a shot. Put them in. And he turned to the seven of us and said, so, are you all married? And there was this silence. And at the time we all were, so we had to say yes. He looked very disappointed, bless him. And probably took the cufflinks out and then went to the next dressing room. Oh. Then. <laughs> but, you know, we have to remember this was only probably two years after the de decriminalisation of homosexuality. Yeah. So the law had only just changed two years ago. And Frankie didn't have what you would have today, which is social media and ways yeah. of connecting with other guys. So. Yeah. Um, looking back on it, you see it through different spectacles these yeah. days. Yeah. I mean, as you say, you were you um, you know the place itself um, was phenomenally successful, wasn't it? I mean, in terms of customers coming through, mm. you know, the massive audiences. You know, did were you surprised at its level of success? Because 
as you say, it's in a funny place, and you're thinking, right, okay. Because I always remember that with it was a club in um, uh, Greaseboro, and just the name. Oh, yes. Just, you know, it's yes. so off putting, isn't it? Greaseboro. It doesn't look good in print. Uh, no, it? no. And then when we were, we were making a, a thing with Jay Mansfield, um, not her, but a documentary, uh, and the guy said, oh, yeah, she did a week then. I thought, what must she have thought? I know, I know. <laughs> Going to this, there's nothing wrong with it, but yeah. you've been in the Hollywood Hills, Beverly Hills, and you're now in Greaseboro, you mm. know. So, did you, you know, the Golden Garter had a massive marketing campaign. And yes. There were always big, luscious ads and stuff yes. like that. What do you think the secret of its success was, you know, when you think about well, it? Well, it was now? the marketing, because I spoke to someone recently that used to work uh, backstage, not backstage, used to work in the admin office, and apparently they had 250,000 people on their database, oh. and they were mailing out letters every week. They were yeah. getting coach parties that were coming from yeah. miles away, and there were a lot of people that used to have a regular table. They would come every Friday night, and that was their table down there by oh. the stage. So people did, I mean, it was just fabulous. It was a new thing in Manchester. It was the big, big club, and they got the kind of stars there that uh, the other clubs didn't somehow manage to obtain. Well, was it expensive, though, John, to go in? Because, you know, when, when we did the thing with Batley, yeah. I was amazed. I mean, I know it's a different time and everything, but you look and think, so you were able to see Louis Armstrong for what? You know what I, I mean? Know, I know. But I suppose it's, a, it's equations of money today. Yeah. Really. But what would it cost, say, to see, I don't know, like Frankie Vaughan? What would yeah. that have been in that Well, um, if you saw Frankie Vaughan, uh, it would probably be 75p in today's money, <laughs> or maybe a pound. Gosh. But if you got, I mean, then later on as the years went by, because the club was open for 15 years, yeah. then you had the Bee Gees there, and that probably would cost you a, a couple of pounds, probably three, three pounds <laughs> fifty maybe for the Bee Gees. Not bad though, is it? Of course, the Bee Gees were from Manchester originally, Absolutely. weren't they? So they would have gone down a storm. Yeah, I imagine they, so. Yeah, yeah, very clever yeah. actually by yeah. them. I mean, you've also got uh, the, the pictures that you sent us, they say are lovely. Um, one of my, my favourites who we've been lucky enough to interview here is uh, Helen Shapiro. Oh, yes. Now, I love her. I think she's got a fabulous, you know, very individual voice, mm. you know. Even today, I think she looks great, and, you know, she's a lovely lady. But um, she's come to Manchester, and it's a few years now after the hits. Yes. So, what was she like? What was she doing? Did she just do a, a normal act? Or? Yes, she did. I mean, it was really what people wanted to see when they came to see Helen Shapiro was they wanted her to sing Walking Back to Happiness. They wanted to see Don't her. treat me like a child. That's right, it? yeah. All the hits, they wanted to hear those. And um, it's interesting because if you think about the different lengths of time that people would be on stage, they might just do a short time on stage or they might do a long time. So yeah. in her case, it was just a series of vocal numbers. Yeah. Other people, like we spoke about Lonnie Donegan, yeah. he would show all sides to his to his personality and his abilities, I suppose. Yeah. But my recollection is that Helen was a great singer, but she was there to sing the songs. She yeah. had a great orchestral backing and oh, she sang yeah. the songs and people loved it. And she kept the hits for the last couple of minutes of yeah. the act. Of course she did, yeah. Yeah, oh no, that sounds nice. I mean, did I read right? Was Shirley Bassey going to come and then she didn't turn up? What happened there? Because she was big in Batley, I remember. I remember as a kid seeing, you know, we were talking about the paper ads and when she was in Batley, they, mm. they used to have a full page, you know. Yeah. I remember my dad saying, oh, you know, uh, it's very expensive to see Shirley Bassey, you know what I mean? And yeah. When you're a kid, you think, is it? Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. you're not that bothered, really. Yeah. But what did did she not turn up, or what was the deal? I what mean? happened was that Shirley Bassey was going to come to the Golden Garter. This was just the biggest thing that had ever happened. This was at a time when you were paying 75p to get in. Now the tickets were going to cost you £2. Yeah. So oh, a big so that was a lot of money, actually. In yeah, those yeah, days, yeah. yeah. Right. So um, our drummer in the band, who was quite an entrepreneur, thought, I'm going to make a killing here, and he bought up a whole load of tickets. <laughs> At two pounds. <laughs> you know where this is going, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> Poor man. <laughs> and of course, suddenly it's sold out for the week. Then she decides she's going to do a fortnight. So then he buys some more tickets for the second week. So now it's absolutely sold out. Bear in mind that we're talking about 8,400 seats per week. So she's selling out 16,000, 17,000 tickets, a all been sold. Yeah. And a lot of them have been bought by our drummer. Yeah. He's been borrowing money left, right and centre to buy as many of these tickets as he can because he knows he can sell them at probably four times the yeah. price. Oh, yeah. And then the news comes through, the advert goes into the Manchester Evening News. It is with regret that we announce that Miss Bassey will not be appearing due to circumstances beyond hers and our control. We never find out why Shirley didn't make the first week, but someone's got to fill in. So they got the big star of the year who had just done the Royal Variety Show, which was Freddie Starr. Oh, was, I love Freddie Starr. He was great. Very clever, and he yeah. was really at his prime at that point. Yeah. Fabulous, doing all the impressions and everything. Yeah. And in fact, people, because you, you could be entitled to a cancellation fee. Yeah. You could be entitled to get your money back 
you could be entitled to have a refund if you weren't happy about seeing Freddie Starr. But people had seen him on the Royal Variety Show. They knew it was going to be a great night. And so to come fun. to Manchester, great. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah. yeah. So that was fine. That was the first week. So Freddie covered for Shirley. But yeah. now we're on to week two. We think, well, we are going to meet Shirley now, surely. But sh sadly, Shirley did not show up. That's a lot of S's. Shirley, sadly, surely. <laughs> and do, so, I mean... The, they must have been really disappointed, though, these people. Oh, because absolutely. As much as you love Freddie Starr, and I think he's a comedy genius, but, mm. you know, you're going for a singer who's, you know, mega, absolutely. internationally famous. Absolutely. So you kind of think, well, OK, yeah, I'll go and see him. But the next week, you're going to think, well, is she coming? That's right. <laughs> and when she wasn't going to show, now they're really faced with a problem <laughs> because they've got to find someone at very short notice. We have a 20-piece orchestra that's booked to back Shirley. And they're already going to be paid. You've got to pay yeah. for the orchestra. So now yeah. we've got to find someone that is an international star who's available for that week. Yeah. Well, they got Max Bygraves, and Max did a storm, God bless him. I love Max. Yeah. I thought he was a ve another a very clever man. But meanwhile, think about our drummer who's bought all these tickets <laughs> for two quid, sold them for eight pounds. He's got lots of people knocking on the door wanting their money back. Oh. Uh, he'd already spent the money, so um, he wasn't... Uh, uh, visible to a lot of people. <laughs> he kept a low profile, shall we say. You can imagine when they came back to the club as well, though, John. There he is. Uh, he's <laughs> got our money. Because <laughs> it's funny, isn't it? You, it's an interesting thing. You talk about that, like... And I know you're making um, a documentary about the time of the club. Yeah. How was that going along and how did that, you know, why did you decide to do that? Is it because you think it wasn't documented enough? Well, I think I saw some programmes on the television about the music hall and yeah. about theatre generally. And I thought there's never been anything on TV that's about the nightclubs. Yeah. Um, I mean, what I'm making is I'm making really what amounts to an am amateur video, which I hope to get onto YouTube. But yeah, I but think it's good it... that you're documenting it, you know, because it, when it's gone, it's gone. Yeah, that's, that's right. That's the thing, isn't it? Well, I suppose I felt I was so lucky that I was in the right place at the right yeah. time and I happened to have this wonderful experience for these three and a half years at the Golden Garter. And I thought to myself, these days there are websites for everything. People yeah. are fascinated at finding out bits of information yeah. and there was no website about who played the Golden Garter. Yeah. So I thought, right, little project for me. Yeah. So I took myself off to the British Library in London and I sat there for weeks and weeks and weeks and I went through every single copy of the Manchester Evening News that covered the 14-year period. And are they all in there? I kid you not, they've got wow. every single newspaper. And I made a list and I've now put it on the website, so www.thegoldengarter.co.uk yeah. and on there you can see every single act that ever played the Golden Garter. Wow. Um, is there something that you'd forgotten about, though? You know what I mean? Because there's do... some lovely surprises. Yeah, because you look you forget when you're in the shows. You, it's just week after week after yeah, week. Yeah, you kind of think, yeah. oh yeah, of course I remember yeah. playing. I mean, one of the lovely old-fashioned comedy turns that I just think was fantastic was Jimmy Edwards. Oh yeah. Now Jimmy yeah. Edwards. Wacko, you mean Jimmy? That's Edwards, right. Yeah. yeah, he played the headmaster yeah. in the on television. Yeah. But of course, people didn't know what his nightclub act was all about. And it was him doing the same act that he'd done probably back in the 40s and the 50s. Yeah. But it was still very, very funny. And did people like it? They know? loved it. They loved yeah. it. I mean, obviously, being the age he was, because he was well into his 50s by then, yeah. it would have had a more limited appeal probably than maybe the week after when yeah. we had The Bachelors there, for example. Yeah. But nevertheless, it was for a musician, it yeah. was just lovely, because Jimmy's act basically was playing a whole series of wind instruments. He played the trombone, he played the tuba. Yeah. He finished the act with the post horn. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You see, Jimmy, to me, looked like he was born to play a headmaster. Yeah, You yeah. know what I mean? Because that's what you knew him from. He just had the look and he was very clever at it. And, and the handlebar moustache, Yeah, and, and you wonder, like you say, rightly, John, whether today, if he was to go on it, how would it work? You know, would mm. people accept that as comedy now? Because mm. what we laughed at then, not necessarily now, you know. So tell me, how did you end up then becoming into the uh, mega hit with the lovely Johnny Hamp? The comedians, how did that come around? Do you know what I mean? It's... Yeah, well, we'd been at the Golden Garter. The band was there, as I say, from opening night on the 7th of October, 68. And then within two years, 1970, Johnny Hamp, unknown to us, had got this idea of doing the comedians, this quick fire. Uh, series of comics yeah. um, and he needed a band, a musical act to put at the beginning of the show, at the end of the show and to do a musical number every week after the commercial break yeah. and he was in the Golden Garter, the story goes he was in the Golden, Golden Garter one night in the audience with his wife and his wife V nudged him and said Johnny, that's the band for you Always trust a good woman. <laughs> yeah, I've met V, she was a lovely lady actually Yeah, yeah. and that's, so really that's how it got, he then contacted you and 
then the band ended up on TV. Yeah, well, the great thing, this is a lovely thing, was, of course, because the taping for the comedians was actually done in the afternoon and the early evening. Yeah. So I was still able to keep the daytime job being a computer programmer. <laughs> I was I just going to ask you that. Were you still working full time? It's unbelievable. Yeah. I was yeah. doing the day job from nine till five. <laughs> I was going to the Granada TV studios in the early evening and taping the comedians. Then I was yeah. at the Golden Garter at 10 o'clock playing with the band on stage. So I was doing three jobs a day instead of two. Did but your family ever see you? <laughs> you look back, don't you? Did you? Do you look back on that as like a mad period? Like, uh, you know Again, I, mean? I was 22, 23. When you're yeah. that age, nothing phases you. You know, yeah. you're just... You just run. I think I was so excited to be yeah. in show business. I'd always wanted to be in show business, and here my dreams were coming true. Yeah. Who's going to turn down the chance to be on a well, TV no, show? Well, no, I was going to say, and you know, as we said at the beginning, it's when TV was massive. Oh, yeah. Million, I mean, 90 million people watching these, these shows. What were your memories of the comedians? Who were your favourites? Because I love I George Rope, I thought he was yeah. fabulous. Um, I love Ken Goodwin. Ken Goodwin could make you laugh because he was laughing. Yes. It's like what you said about yes. Tommy. Yes. He just came on giggling and you're laughing. You think, I don't know why. It's very but interesting, it's very, isn't it? very funny, if you, know? you think about some of the comedians today, like Jack D, for example, yeah. his gimmick is that he'll come on and he'll tell jokes, but he'll keep a straight face. Yeah. In the old days... So do we when he's finished, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Jack. <laughs> In the old days, um, it wasn't unusual for the comedian to laugh at the end of the joke. Yeah. But I think it was an interesting technique, because if the joke didn't go well, there wasn't an awful silence, because the comic yeah. himself was laughing into the microphone. Yeah. In Ken's case, his, his gags were great, because yeah. they were so much down-to-earth, basic humour that people just absolutely adored. And Ken was a particular favourite of mine. Yeah. Did yeah. you like Charlie Williams? You Charlie was him. lovely. Charlie was fabulous. It wasn't not, I know it sounds on PC today, but to hear a black man speaking with such a broad accent... It was very incongruous, it was just wasn't weird, it? wasn't it? Yeah. You'd look at him thinking, what? Yeah. You know, like, and that was part of the charm, I think. Yeah. yeah, absolutely part of the charm, because we knew exactly everything he was saying. He yeah. was speaking with an accent that was very, very familiar yeah. to us, yes. And, and now, and, and some of his comedy, I, I read something recently and they said, oh, you know, some, so on PC. It's funny's funny. I think you know, so. It's just, I think the guy so. was just funny. Yeah. I thought that um, all of the, I was lucky enough to see some of the shows when Johnny put them together uh, at the Winter Gardens about 10, 12 years ago now, yeah. 2006. I mean. And, um, I, you know, when you look at people like Bernard, Bernard um, Manning, to me, uh, whatever you thought was a comedy genius. Oh, he could yes. go out and he could just grand but audience now the, he was a character mm. it's a bit like you you know when you're playing sing along don't you know you are a character you're not the character when you're off stage you you know so i think people confuse that with bernard and mm. i found him to be very warm funny yes very kind man yes. very very yes. kind yes. but just didn't want it going out there yes. that he was kind i know, know but, i know did a lot of work for charity yeah. but people took what they saw on the screen and thought that was yeah. the real person and what was johnny hump like as a because to me i think um Oh, John or Johnny Hamper, whichever you want to call him, he's so underrated as what he did for comedy, for variety in that period. You mm. know, I mean, I've been lucky enough to meet him. I thought he was a lovely man, met his, his wife, Fee. And, but, you know, when you think about it, he created many things that have lasted Absolutely. And, and loved yeah. for so many years. I love the wheel tappers and shunters because we've all been there, haven't we? I've Absolutely. been to a club like that. And, uh, you know, he said they had real pies and, mm. you know, and they, they'd have a bit of a booze to get them flowing, yeah. you know. Yeah, the I mean, pies Johnny have was come. clever, yeah. Neil, the pies have oh, come. Yeah. Put plenty of pepper on because they've come on their own. Yeah, they were terrible, weren't they? And when you went into these clubs, uh, the concert secretaries and stuff. Um, I was looking to go with some, some of these with my mom and dad, and they were like Colin Crompton. Yes, yes. they were like that. You now know? you asked earlier on about who I particularly was fa favourite. Who were uh, favourite comics of mine? And Colin was a sweetie. Oh yeah, he was absolutely lovely. Loved him. Very very generous man. If yeah. you were ever out with Colin, he had to buy the drinks for everybody. Oh he really? He was just very very generous. Yeah, yeah, very very generous. And yet not remembered as much today as the others. Do you know what I mean? No, when you think no. Of comedians, you you everybody remembers with affection Charlie and Ken and Bernard. Yeah. But I thought uh, Colin, with his bell and his flat hat and all yeah. that, uh, he was very clever and he had a very droll sense of humour, mm. you know. Um, did they, w when they were doing it, was there a lot of ad-libs going on? You know, did they stick to a certain script or it looked like Bernard and him were just flying off each I other I think they sometimes. were able to because of their experience just yeah. dealing with hecklers. They could, they could bounce off the pair of each other. Yeah. Maybe the reason that Colin didn't become... Maybe the reason that Colin didn't become as... 
big as some of the others was because he got the wheel tappers and shunters with Bernard. Yeah. But let's look at the number of comedians that went on to host their own game shows that yeah. were on the comedians. For example, Les Dennis got Family Fortunes. Yeah. Jim Bowen got Bullseye. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Roy Walker got Catchphrase. Yeah, love Roy. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. Mike Reed got run around on yeah. children's TV. Which we loved as kids, I Absolutely. remember that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, there are others that were... Yeah. I mean, you're right, it was a springboard to fame for a lot of people. Mm. Did, you know, for you, you were saying before we came on air that um, I've forgotten you'd made records, you know, like, I mean, you've got albums and stuff like that. And you're trying to, you want to put those out on CD now. And I think they would go well. Mm. Um, and, you know, but... With the, the albums themselves, can you remember making them and stuff like that? I mean, Well, I can. One particular one we did was for chapels. It was a music library LP. So this is making music that they will use as background music in films and on television. Oh, right. And not ones that were sold over the counter. And yeah. we came down on the train from Manchester and recorded all ten tracks in the one day and then back on the train because we had to be on stage at the Golden Garter at 10.15. Can 10 you imagine doing that today? Do you well, know what I mean? How long does it take to make an LP say, these days? In terms of an album, that's what I love when you talk about, you know, we meet some lovely people from the Golden days of rock and roll and stuff and they say oh you know Tommy Steele said oh we did four tracks in an afternoon you know yeah. you think that's almost an album you know? yeah, <laughs> so, that's right. so you came down you, you you made it and then you went back yeah so that's what I'm saying it must have been slightly a blur in certain things because you're working very hard yes. and you're doing exciting things yes. and then going into Granada TV so when you were going back in your day job and you've sort of been in Granada TV I bet everybody said oh what, who did you see well, what of was course it like? they you all want to know they because they, they are already read in the Manchester Evening News who's the star of the week, so they want yeah. all the backstage gossip. What is Moira Anderson really like? Loved her. Yeah. Wasn't Stars she... on Sunday, she was lovely. Yeah. yeah. Although Moira, bless her, she had a little bit of a record at the Golden Garter. Oh. We used to, just for fun, put the stopwatch on the top of the billax. We used to watch how long they'd do. Ken Dodd, for example, there's a good example. Now, if Ken Dodd was on stage, you mustn't expect to leave the theatre till two o'clock in the morning. Yeah. Um, and in fact, there would be somebody sitting in the wings, not timing with a stopwatch, but using a calendar, which is wow. an old Bob Monkhouse gag. <laughs> yeah, Moira it. Anderson, at the other end of the scale, did 23 minutes and she was gone. Oh. But of course, what a fantastic 23 minutes, yeah. very, very concise. If I'd been in the audience, I think I would have felt a bit shortchanged at 23 yeah. minutes. I think I'd expect 45 probably as a minimum. Yeah, yeah, you're right, actually. I think people, because of then, you know, people have, um, it's hard to explain, but when you're in those clubs, they're, they're giving their hard earned money from a week's you know, work in maybe a factory or something. Yes. So they want value. It's mm -hmm. not like, you know, today where a celebrity can go on for 10 minutes, do a couple of songs and go. They've paid their money, haven't oh, yeah. they? And they're they buying their, their booze. They and, want it, you know. yeah. And interestingly, Moira had a little bit of a technical problem at the theatre. I mean, the orchestra, which was a 10-piece band, had been augmented up to a 12-piece. So she had all the dots there, the professional musicians, conductor, Oh. who decided that instead of using his hand to conduct the orchestra, he would have a baton. Oh, God. Yeah. And so there's Derek Butterworth with his augmented show band, Moira Anderson Centre Stage, and they'd actually flown in some scenery as well. Oh. So they'd really gone to town. Now, the only problem was that it was very cramped on this stage. And I as, can De imagine. <laughs> as Derek lifted his arm to conduct the band, his elbow caught the scenery, which started to move backwards and forwards. Oh. So Moira knows that she's got the audience in fits of laughter and she can't work out why. Yeah. The scenery is going backwards and forwards. The musicians are losing, losing their place in their dots. She actually stopped the show. She said, well, that was the rehearsal. Now we'll do it properly. Oh. That was on the Monday night. So I think it went downhill on that particular week, sadly. Oh. I mean, you, a lovely picture you sent through of um, one of my favourites was uh, Frankie Vaughan. Oh, Frankie. I mean, I, I, to me, he was just such a class act, wasn't yes, he? Yes, yes. Um, it always baffled me. I was lucky enough to, to meet and interview him, but I always remember, he was talking about being in a film with Marilyn Monroe. Mm. And I always remember thinking, and he said, and the next year I was in summer season in Blackpool. I thought, how does that work? I know, you know what lo I mean? lovely contrast, isn't it? <laughs> but what was he like? Because he was very much, to me, a theatrical performer. What was he like in a nightclub environment? He was then? just brilliant. I mean, he had a very, very polished stage act, and mm. that was the kind of act that transferred perfectly from a theatre to a nightclub. The only difference was, instead of having the musicians in a pit in front of him, he had the musicians behind yeah. him on stage. But the act, I'm sure, was exactly the same. He knew exactly how to play the audience. He knew that they wanted Give Me the Moonlight as yeah. the last number. And the kick. Yeah. And the kick, of course, and the cane and the yeah. top hat. So they got all of that with Frankie Vaughan. Lovely story about Frankie that sticks in my mind. Bear in mind, we've got 1,400 seats to fill for six nights, 8,400 seats. Wow. It's a lot of seats to yeah. sell. For in an area it is. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, even though there were coach parties coming yeah. in and these people that had their own table every week. But nevertheless, there were weeks when things were a little bit quiet 
And uh, Frankie, Frankie, bless him, had this lovely expression which I've used ever since. I heard somebody say to me, if Frankie was playing the club, he'd ask how the business was, and if it was a bit quiet, he'd say, paper the room, paper yeah. the room. Which, yeah. of course, meant give comps out and yeah. get, uh, get people in every seat, yeah. whatever it took. John, thank you so much for being my guest today. I really enjoyed myself. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.